What's going on, everybody? I got two very special guests with me. We have a packed show today, a big weekend in the NFL for the division round of the playoffs. I got David Ruiz. David, how's it going, bro? Great. Huh? I got Rob Parks. Rob, what's up, bro? What's up, bro? What's up, bro? You all right? You all right? All right. To, to start off, this, these we got some elite quarterbacks playing in this, this weekend's matchup. But who you think has the most pressure to deliver? I mean, you got Pat Mahomes, who looks like people are trying to say is chasing the goat in Tom Brady. Other people are saying Aaron Rodgers, he's going to win league MVP, and he's trying to make a mark in his legacy. What about Drew Brees? This may be his last chance to win a championship. So, Rob, I'll start with you. Who do you think has the most pressure in these playoffs? I would say Aaron Rodgers, um, just because for the fact he only has one Super Bowl ring, and he's come out short like all these years in a row. Um, and this is his best team he's had in a few years, so people are picking him to win. So I would say Aaron Rodgers. That's my pick. David? Yeah, Aaron Rodgers is a good pick, but I'm going to go with Baker Mayfield. I think Cleveland mm. Browns have been the butt you know, of the NFL for a long time now, and they finally have a good squad this year. And Baker Mayfield, you know, his rookie year wasn't you know too high on it, but this year has surprised a lot of people – by going into Pittsburgh and being Pittsburgh, I think all eyes will be on Baker Mayfield in Kansas City this weekend. The thing I can't I can't say Baker Mayfield has the most pressure on him. When we're talking about pressure, we're talking about someone dealing with expectations to deliver, and that would be a failure on their resume or something amongst those lines. I've always been very critical of Baker Mayfield, and I still am. I believe Baker should be better than what he is. He's drafted number one overall. He's on a team that is surrounded with talent. The best running back duo in the league. You got Jarvis Landry on the outside. Austin Hooper proved to be, uh, be a pretty good tight end. A great offensive line. Baker Mayfield should be better than what he is. And as a number one overall pick, you have those expectations. I'm in the belief Baker should be an MVP, like an MVP caliber player, which he's not. He's underperformed. So if you want to look at pressure that way, I get it. But no, none of us here, and I don't know anyone, maybe people in Cleveland, Ohio, are in the delusion to pick the Browns over the Chiefs to beat Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs. So it's hard for me to take the Brown or Baker Mayfield rather for the most pressure. I have two guys that I'm stuck on between. It's Aaron Rodgers. It's Drew Brees. Why is that? They are guys with fantastic regular season resumes, but their postseason resumes don't match their regular season, which is why we can't put them in a certain status of greatness. When we look at Aaron Rodgers, before Mahomes arrived, he's been regarded as the most talented quarterback in the history of the NFL in terms of throwing the pure, throwing the football, the way his ball placement, the way he could extend plays, throwing the run, throw from the pocket, accuracy, the whole nine yards. Rodgers does everything. But Rodgers and the Packers should have more playoff success. He won that one Super Bowl once upon a time in 2010 against the Pittsburgh Steelers where he won Super Bowl MVP. That's great. But when you're, when you're compared to guys like a Tom Brady, he should have more to his resume. And this year... There's no excuses for him. I mean, you got the best receiver in my eyes in Devontae Adams. You have probably the best team you've had in a really long time. You're going to win league MVP after the Packers basically slapped in the face, moving up in the draft to draft to Jordan Love, move up in the draft, uh, no less. So that's basically saying that we're ready to move on from Aaron Rodgers. So that's why the Packers have zero excuse not to win the title. But on the flip side, you can make the argument for Drew Brees, which honestly is probably going to be my top one. People try to say that Drew Brees should be in the code conversation of quarterbacks. One of the most accurate quarterbacks in NFL history, if I'm not mistaken, is all-time leader in passing yards. Again, but the playoff resume is not there. Once upon a time in 2009, they did win the Super Bowl against the Indianapolis Colts. Great win. What have they really done since? A lot of that narrative was the Saints never had a great defense. Well, the past four years now, they've always had a very, very, very good defense. And look at the ways they went down. The Stefan Diggs miracle, are we going to blame that on Drew Brees? No. But once you have that really bad collapse, it's almost like you can never really recover. So then on the, and then you go the year after, the pass interference call. We all remember that play. Again, maybe you don't want to uh, throw that on Drew Brees? Sure. And then last year, he was the third best quarterback on the field behind Kirk Cousins getting outplayed him at home and Taysom Hill Taysom Hill Hill literally outplayed him. So with that being said, this may be Drew Brees' last hurrah with the Saints. And a guy of that caliber, I I believe he needs to get it done. So I believe Drew Brees next to Aaron Rodgers, has the most pressure on him. What are your thoughts on that? Drew Brees has been in this league for a number of years now, and as you've said, yeah, his playoff success, it's, it's not a great one. 
You know, they were upset last year by the Minnesota Vikings. They were, you know, they lost the championship game to the Los Angeles Rams two years ago. Uh, yeah, it's all the accolades and success that Drew Brees and New Orleans and Sean Payne has had over the years. It's just not resulted in the Super Bowl. You know, if they're going to get it done this year, it's a possibility. But, you know, they'll have to take on, they'll have to beat Tom Brady three times in a row to get there. Yeah, I kind of I kind of agree with you about Brees. That was my other pick. Um besides for Aaron Rodgers, because like you said, they have been once since the 2009 season. Really, the Super Bowl happened in 2010, but um, it's 11 years, bro. So <laughs> you're, coming to the end of your, you're coming to the end of your career. You're coming to the end of life. You just got back from a rib injury, or well, ribs, plural. You just got back from that. And uh, you got to get it done. Every year you flame out, man. Drink Drew, Brees. Drew Brees and Aaron Rodgers both flame out every year in the playoffs. Let's keep it real. I feel like Aaron Rodgers gets a pass because – He's so talented, man, and he can throw the he can throw that rock around. So he gets a pass. Like Aaron Rodgers loses the play. Oh, whatever. Nobody says nothing. Well, a few a few things with that. I want to stay on this topic a little bit longer in terms of we understand that Breeze and Rodgers probably have the most pressure on them, but a guy like Pat Mahomes, their their expectation is to win the title. They have the best, he's the best quarterback in the game by a wide margin. If you're going to ask me, yes, I believe he's much better than Aaron Rodgers because we know what he does in playoff time. You have that dynamic duo on the offensive side of the ball with Travis Kelsey and Tyreek Hill. You got a very good running game right now. It seems like there's no excuses. How much of a failure, or would this even be considered a stain if the Chiefs at one point in these playoffs get upset, even the Super Bowl, given they still look like they're the best team in the NFL? Like, would that be a failure on his resume right now? And sometimes we look back and say, wow, this is the year where Mahomes failed us. And because he's, it looks like he's chasing Brady as the go. That's how it looks like this early in his career. His peak right now, this early, is one of the best we've ever seen in our lifetime, if not the best. So would this be a failure on his resume, or is it something that it's just not going to be that big of a deal because he's so young and has so much time left and he already won a Super Bowl? What are your thoughts on that, Rob? It, it'll be a failure, but I don't think people will hold it against him down the line just because. You got to think of um, he's so young and in football, you kind of have like more leeway. Like it's not like the NBA where like, you got like short leagues like LeBron, like, oh, LeBron loses is a failure. Like everybody's pounding on LeBron. Nobody's going to pound on Pat Mahomes if he loses to the Browns or if he loses the next round in the AFC championship, you know. So, um, but they are the best team. I expect them to probably repeat. But if they don't, I don't think people are really going to hold that against him. He'll just be right back next year in the same boat because they're going to be good, you know? Yeah, I agree. This is way too talented of a team to not win the Super Bowl this season. But if they do get upset this week or next week, I don't think it's a massive failure. I mean, this is a young team. Patrick Mahomes is not going anywhere. He's going to win more Super Bowls, more MVPs. He's got, you know, arguably, like you said, a great tight end, a great wide receiver, one of the best coaches in Andy Reid. Um, yeah, if they get upset, it's it's not the end of the world. They'll be right back, especially in a division that has a lot of up and coming teams, but not no one that's going to contend right now. And so, yeah, if if Patrick Mahomes doesn't get it done this year, they'll be just fine moving forward. I'm going to say this is a failure in his resume. There's no reason why they, any team should beat them. There's no team that's really better than them. The Bills are a great team, which we're going to touch on that next topic, which I don't see the Bills even making it past this round. Yeah, I said that. And then they absolutely should not lose against the Cleveland Browns. I always looked at the Browns as like literally and figuratively the wild card team of these playoffs. Literally the wild card team is they literally have the wild card spot. And figuratively because we literally have no idea what to expect from them. Baker sometimes on one Sunday, he'll look like a top 10 quarterback. He looks awesome. And then another day, he looks like one of the worst quarterbacks in the league. And with that much talent on that roster, as I stated earlier in this segment, I believe he should be better than what he is. But that does not give any reason why that Browns defense should even stand a chance. So I'm actually from Cleveland originally. I don't know if you guys knew that. Uh, I live in D.C. now. I live in D.C. last seven years. So, you know, all my friends I grew up with are Browns fans. I'm not a Browns fan. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Cowboys fan, but we're we not even in the picture right now. But uh, Baker, you know, Everybody says the same thing I say about him. Baker is shaky, man. Baker is sometimey. Like you said, sometimes Baker looks like all-world Baker from Oklahoma Heisman Baker. Sometimes Baker looks like complete crap. So what are you going to get against the Chiefs? 
And I think the Browns, you know, the Browns got to run the ball, man. Like, that got to be their first first priority. Cream Hunt, Chubb got to pound it against the Chiefs. You know, hopefully they can get some turnovers like they get, did against Pittsburgh, maybe a fumble recovery, interception, pick six. Something like that has to go their way for them to beat the Chiefs because if not, you know, the Chiefs is coming out smoking, man. All right, well, I want to switch topics real quick. I want to talk about the Bills and the Ravens. So the thing is, the Buffalo Bills, 13-3, and a red-hot team. But the Ravens, they're quietly looking really good. Lamar Jackson, as some may say, got the monkey off his back that he finally won a playoff game, so he's going to know how to win now. But there's something a little skeptical about this game. People who are betters out there, the Bills are only a favorite by two points at home against the Ravens. Are the Bills on upset alert? David, we'll start with you. Absolutely. I mean, it begins and will end with Lamar Jackson, right? He got his first playoff win a week ago. Tennessee failed, failed to contain Lamar Jackson, had a hell of a game. If Buffalo is going to win this game, they need to contain Lamar Jackson. But if Jackson's legs get going, plus his arms look pretty good last few weeks of the season as well. If Lamar Jackson has another can't stop me game, Buffalo's going home. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, I, I agree with you. I think um, they're on upset alert, but like you said, I don't really consider that an upset that the Ravens beat them. The Buffalo Bills, man, come on now. <laughs> you know, even though they're thirteen and three, like I, I, I just don't trust. I don't trust Buffalo to get it done past the second round, which we're in. So I'm picking the. I'm picking the Ravens, man. Wait, why do you trust the? But why do you trust the? Uh, you don't trust the Bills, but you trust the Ravens. <laughs> I trust the Ravens because, like you said, because of Lamar Jackson. Like Lamar is so dynamic, he can get it done with his arm. Of course, he can get it done with his legs. And you know, I don't know if they're going to be able to stop him. Like, how are the Ravens going to stop Josh Allen, who's looked like an MVP candidate? Yeah, Josh is a killer too. Yeah, you got a good point. So, I mean, I think that's going to be a good game. Like, it's like it's two points right now as far as betting goes. So. We'll see. I'm picking the Ravens, but, you know, it could be a toss-up, you know. If Baltimore is going to upset Buffalo, they did do, do a hell of a job in containing Derrick Henry, who's been borderline unstoppable this year. So Josh Allen's also kind of that, you know, running, scrambling quarterback as well. If they can contain him in the pocket, I mean, look out. Well, a few, a few things. Football-wise, the Bills should absolutely win this game. There's one reason why I'm picking the Ravens, which doesn't have a whole lot of context, but – it's always proven true. Vegas knows things we don't know. When you look at a line and something is skeptical about it and something just looks off, there's a reason for that. That's how Vegas makes their money. You see the public will be heavy bills and then they get slammed and that's where they make their bread. That's I think is going to happen this weekend because we saw it last week with the Ravens and the Titans. I came on this platform exactly a week ago today and I picked the Ravens to beat the Titans because it didn't make sense why they were three and a half point favorites on the road against the Titans. You look at that matchup and football wise, it made no sense why they were the favorite. Derrick Henry, in my eyes, should win league MVP. 17 touchdowns over 2,000 yards, the eighth player in NFL history to rush for over 2,000 yards. I believe he should have won MVP, if you're going to ask me, with that kind of season he had. I believe that him running the football made Ryan Tannehill have that great of a season that he did. I always said Ryan Tannehill is not a great quarterback. He's mediocre at best. And people try to look at his numbers and try to tell me otherwise. I say no. He is a product of Derrick Henry. And then you look at Lamar Jackson on the flip side, who's had two playoff woes his first two years in the league. When they were at home, one league MVP, 13-3, projected to go to the Super Bowl, 10-point favorites. And then Derrick Henry runs for 195 yards on them. And they get absolutely annihilated in that game where Lamar Jackson was awful. So why this year, with the Titans winning the AFC South, with Derrick Henry having one of the best seasons we've seen in NFL history, why then would they be favorites? It just made no sense to me. And I just thought, Vegas knows things we don't know. The Ravens were three and a half point favorites. And you see heavy, heavy, heavy picks on the Tennessee Titans. And what happens? Lamar ran all over them. I don't remember ever seeing Derrick Henry being literally stopped, not even contained. He got stopped. 18 rushes for 40 yards. I can't remember. If someone told yeah, me the yeah, that stopped. Derrick Henry would have 40 yards in a game, I'd be like, you're out of your mind. And what do you know? He was stopped for 40 yards, and the Ravens win the game and cover that spread, which didn't make football sense to me. But now looking at this week, 
I say the same thing. I believe the Bills won nine of their last ten games, and their one loss came on the uh, DeAndre Hopkins Megatron 2.0 Hail Mary miracle. That was their one loss since they lost to the Kansas City Chiefs, like week four, whenever that game was this season. So when I look at this matchup, it doesn't make sense, again, football-wise, why the Ravens, who Lamar still hasn't proven that he could really throw you back into games and win football games with his arm, why now am I supposed to expect that they're going to beat the Bills? with the And the spread is only two? I just see public heavy will be on the Bills, and Vegas is going to cash out. Like, football-wise, I don't understand it. But I'm going to ask you guys, why do you think that spread is so close like that? Like, shouldn't the Bills be a heavier favorite? Yeah, absolutely. Buffalo has looked really good at home. I believe I believe they only have one home loss this season. Yeah, and Josh Allen has played at an MVP like level. The addition of Stephon Diggs has been humongous. They have a really good defense. They're a coach. The thing is, they're a young team. They're inexperienced. You look back at last year's playoff loss against Houston in a game they probably should have won. Their inexperience caught up to them. This year, they're a much more better team. They look like veterans, but. You know, it's it's hard to stop Lamar Jackson. It really is. That's what it's going to come down to. I think this game could be the most explosive of the weekend. It could be a heavy shootout, or it could be a 10-3 to 3 type of game. Like, it, it's going to be that type of a game. Yeah, I, I was going to say the exact same thing. Um, Buffalo's young. Like I said, they lost, they lost in the first round of Houston last year. They flamed out. They should have won that game. Um, I just don't think Vegas really trusts them. And Lamar Jackson, you know, coming off an of MVP season last year, we all know what he can do. He can really get it done. So, I mean, if, if, he, if he gets to running against them, it could get ugly, man. I don't I don't really trust the Buffalo Bills. But I do like Stephon Diggs, man. So, if he gets off, then, you know, they could win. The Josh Allen and the Stephon Diggs connection have to be going, man. The Bills just have so much firepower, it's hard to really look at this, though. Like, Josh Allen's had an MVP caliber season, which Lamar did not do anything close to what he nah, did. Nah, he did not. He didn't. He, the, at, one, at one point, it looked like the Ravens weren't even going to make the playoffs, for crying out loud. And, I, and now, look, they're one game away from the AFC Championship, which, according to Vegas odds, looks like it's going to happen, which I'm going to I'm gonna predict for that's the only reason why I think that. That's number one. Number two, like Rob addressed, that Josh Allen to Stephon Diggs, in, in my estimation, is the second best quarterback to wide receiver duo behind Rodgers and Adams, if you're going to ask me. Stefan Diggs leads the league in yards, leads the league in receptions. That was the best move in the offseason, no doubt about it. Him, them acquiring Stefan Diggs, I think, made Josh Allen who he is right now. Josh Allen wasn't very good in his first year in the league. I believe he threw more interceptions and touchdowns. His sophomore year looked like he was progressing better, but wow, did he make a jump this year. I thought in the beginning of the season, Allen's progression, I thought it was a fluke. I'm not going to lie. I always called him overrated. I called the Bills overrated. I just thought there's no way he's making this big of a jump. I said, like, yeah, he has his little honeymoon, his three to four game stretch where he gets really hot, but he's going to come back down to earth. And for a few weeks, he did. He looked like he came back down to earth. But the way they finished that season, he's no joke. He is the real deal. Out of college, out of Wyoming, a small school, it looked like he had a high ceiling because of his big arm, his big presence, which is very impor important for the quarterback position. But I also thought he had the lowest floor. I thought he had the best opportunity out of the top, quote-unquote, four quarterbacks between Baker, Darnold, um, uh, May ba Baker, Darnold, Allen, and Rosen. I always thought Josh Allen would have been the worst out of those four. I mean, that didn't age very well, but that's that was my prediction out of the 2018 draft. But with that combination, the way they could run the ball, and the way their defenses has played at times, it looks like they're clearly the better team. But I guess if we're going to look at that, and wait, we can't. I forget one thing: Bills Mafia. Those fans are probably the most. They're probably the best fans in the world. I, I got. I got to give it a shout out to Bills Mafia. How crazy they get in the parking lot for their tailgates. What they do during the games. The, how loud they get. I believe there's going to be about 7,000 fans in attendance. So football-wise, it looks like the Bills should have this. But I guess what Vegas is seeing is the Ravens get up early. Lamar's going to be able to use his legs, and they're not going to have really an answer. And that Ravens defense, they proved a whole lot against that Titans, that Titans offense. The Titans probably have the second-best offense in the AFC, to say the least, behind the Chiefs, between what Tannehill's done with Derrick Henry. And the fact that they stopped. They stopped Derrick Henry. I guess you got to believe in that defense, and defense does win championships. What are your thoughts on that to wrap up? 
Yeah, uh, Baltimore's defense, I think, a bit underrated coming into this playoffs. Everyone assumed that Derrick Henry was going to rush for another 200 yards, three touchdowns kind of thing, and he didn't. And Baltimore defense set the tone early. They got the ball back to Lamar Jackson, and we saw what he did with it. You know, like I said earlier, if, if, if the Baltimore Ravens are going to upset Buffalo this weekend, they've got to contain Allen, and they've got to contain all their big playmakers. Not an easy task by any means. But they were up to the challenge last week. Last week, we'll see if they can do it again tomorrow. Rob, final thoughts before we move on. Yeah, that defense is the key, and of course, Lamar Jackson is the X factor. Um, so if Buffalo could contain him from running all over the field, they got a great shot, man. But if not, Ravens move on to the AFC Championship, man. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit. Let's go to the NFC. We got the Tampa Bay Buccaneers versus the New Orleans Saints. Tom Brady, Drew Brees. Both quarterbacks looking like the towards the end of their career. Brady, 43 touchdowns at age 43, thrown for 5,000 yards. He still looks like he's got it. Does he have another Super Bowl run in him? History says him and Belichick, when they were in New England, they never made a Super Bowl unless they had a first-round bye. This is a new expectation for Brady, but he's got a chip on his shoulder, the narrative about that he's a system quarterback, he needs Belichick. He's got to win three road playoff games in a row to get to the Super Bowl, get to his 10th Super Bowl. Drew Brees, on the other hand, he's got a lot to prove. He's got to prove why he belongs on the Mount Rushmore of quarterbacks, belong in that GOAT conversation with the Tom Brady's, the Peyton Manning's, the Aaron Rodgers of the world. He has a lot to prove, and this may be his last year in New Orleans. If they don't get this done, they may be looking to move on from him. So who do you got in this matchup, the Bucks or the Saints? David, we'll start with you. I'm going to go upset. I'm going to go Tampa Bay. It's hard to beat Tom Brady three times in a row. It's even harder to beat Tom Brady in the playoffs. Now, I don't want to throw Chicago under the bus, but they weren't really a challenge for this New Orleans team that we saw last week on Nickelodeon, which was a fantastic broadcast. That team, that Chicago team didn't pose any real danger to New Orleans, and we saw New Orleans pulled away late, and that game was over. This Tampa Bay team, on the other hand, Tom Brady has looked fantastic at 43. You know, there's talks that maybe will they be the first team to host the Super Bowl team? If they get by New Orleans, it's a strong possibility. Brady to Evans and Godwin and Rojo, the offenses look great. Their defense is it's, it's getting better. They're going to have a tough task in stopping Alvin Kamara, who basically, I mean, that last time they played the Saints, they got torched by them. You know, Tampa Bay has a lot to lose in this game, but they have a lot to gain as well, setting the tone by going into New Orleans and upsetting the Saints and ending possibly Breeze's career. I agree, man. I got Tampa, man. Tampa just has too many weapons, man. And Antonio Brown is the X factor. He's coming on now. He wasn't even a factor when he first came to the to the Buccaneers. Now he's getting more touches. He's getting more acclimated with Brady. They have that connection there, boys. Mike Evans is a killer. Godwin has great hands. Uh, Rojo's going to be back next week. So I got Tampa, man. Plus, it's, plus you got to remember, it's in the Superdome. It's inside. So oh. that gives Tom Brady um, an advantage, I believe. I don't trust the Saints. I don't trust the Saints. I got the Buccaneers. I'm going upset here as well. I am absolutely taking the Buccaneers. I do not see Brady going out, beating, losing three games to the same team in one season. Once upon a time, Sanchez beat him twice in a year, which is very unprecedented. <laughs> that was a fluke. <laughs> ah, don't, 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 don't throw shade at my team. That was my one glory time rooting for that sorry franchise. But besides the point, they looked, the Bucks looked awful both times they played in New Orleans. Week one, it's like, yo, it's, it's Brady's first game back. There's no OTAs, no preseason, no training camp, nothing. So for a 43-year-old going for the, a new system for the first time in 19 years, of course it's going to take time to gel. My take with the Bucks all year long was September, October, they're going to have a slow start. November and December is where the wheels are going to turn. Brady's going to look like a top-five quarterback, and the Bucks are going to start rolling, and they're going to be deadly going into January, and they're my prediction to win the Super Bowl. Well, that didn't go exactly as planned. September looked kind of rough. October, they looked great. In the November, Brady probably looked like the, one of the worst quarterbacks in the league. And then December, December Brady turned back the clock about five to seven years ago. And now January, that's a guy I really can't bet against. The Bucks are just too good. I like what they have top to bottom. 
Brady, experience, can manage games, clutch. He always uh, has a, a flip he could switch once the postseason time comes. That's who Tom Brady is. We know what he brings to the table. You got Chris Scott, I mean Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, Antonio Brown. Antonio Brown's really coming into himself again. I mean, that trio at the wide receiver position is honestly simply not fair. Probably one of the best wide receiver cores in the league, if not the best. Gronk looks like he's turning back the clock a little bit. Cameron Brate's looking pretty good. That defense at times was a top five defense. They have all the pieces you need to be a championship caliber team. And I always say the NFC is really wide open. I don't trust any team. I don't love any team. I don't believe any team is way above another. Sure, the Packers have the one seed, well-deserved, Rodgers, MVP, we all know that, but there's something about that where the Packers, I feel like you just get disappointed in the playoffs. The Saints, I'm a big believer, is when you have a disappointing heartbreak loss in any sport, it's really hard to recover, and you're probably never going to recover. We've seen it in basketball, we've seen it in football. Like the Atlanta Falcons, for example, Matt Ryan wins MVP. We're up 28 to 3. We know the story, what happened in that game. Where's Matt Ryan been since? Where have the Falcons been? They never recovered. That's just a something that is a stain that you could never remove. It's just a scar in their image where I don't think they could ever recover. The Saints, I believe, are in a similar boat, if you're going to ask me. Like I, I said earlier, I think when we first started the segment, look at the Stefan Diggs miracle. That's a heartbreaking defeat that nobody saw coming. A missed tackle where you lose the game to go to the NFC Championship. That happens. The next year, the pass interference, a, a, a play that should have been a, a call, a call that should have been made, and it doesn't get called and basically overturn that game. That's another thing they couldn't recover because Wild Card Weekend, a team where you got Alvin Kamara, one of the top running backs in the league, Michael Thomas had an historically great year. The all-time leader in catches for one season, 149, past the great Marvin Harrison. With all that, Drew Brees laid an egg at home against the sorry Minnesota Vikings, which Kirk Cousins has a history of continuous choke jobs, continuously not being able to get it done in the fourth quarter, get it done on primetime football. And then you let him come in your building. And it's not like the Vikings really just outplayed the Saints and the Vikings were the superior team. No, no, no. It was Kirk Cousins outplayed Drew Brees. And we saw that especially in overtime. The Vikings had no business being in that game, let alone win the game. So here's my thing with Brees. Now, Brees' numbers are great. He's great. But I don't think he belongs on that Mount Rushmore with Brady, uh, Montana, Elway, Peyton Manning. I just don't think he belongs up there. He's like maybe a tier below, but he's not there. And if he loses against Tampa, he definitely doesn't belong here. This is an opportunity for Brees to really make a mark on his legacy. This late in his career. If I remember correctly, it may be the oldest quarterback to ever win a championship, which Brady still has that as well. I'm still taking Brady and in the, in the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers to make the Super Bowl. That's my pick. I trust him more than any other quarterback in, this, in, this, uh, in the NFC, rather. I trust him over any other quarterback in the NFL outside of Pat Mahomes right now as we stand today. Brady doesn't feel pressure. He ticks it up when he needs to. You know he's going to be big on third down. You know he's going to be clutch. You know he makes the right decisions with the ball. It's just, it's just a security blanket you have with Brady. And now he's got the weapons. You still got a great coach in Bruce Arians. With the defense playing well, it's really hard to bet against them. That's why I like the Bucs in this game so much. And I don't trust the Saints at all. I just feel like they have too many flaws and they've we've counted them in. And they've disappointed us. And when you have those heartbreaking losses, you're never going to recover. There's multiple times in sports we've seen that. I don't think they could recover. I think this is the end for Brees. I think the Saints need to move on. And they got to look for another quarterback, which I believe a great fit for them would be trading for Deshaun Watson or trading for Sam Darnold. What do you guys think about that? Well, we'll start with Deshaun Watson. I, I, I truly believe his time with the Texans are it's going to come to an end sooner rather than later. You know, there's going to be a lot of quarterback needy teams that could use the services of Watson. Chicago is one of them. New Orleans is another. Who knows how that plays out? But one thing that scares me about the Saints is if you look back at that Chicago game last week, I mean, that was a tight game for about three quarters. I mean, you know, credit to New Orleans defense for keeping a pretty you know, sub-level Chicago offense at bay. But, you know, watching that game, I wasn't really convinced that New Orleans was going to start pulling away here anytime soon. 
So if Tampa Bay, you know, if they can control the ball on both sides here, th this could be a real scary game because even if it's in New Orleans and they have the home field advantage, you know, you, you never know in the playoffs. Anything can happen. We've seen it before, and we'll see it again before the 2020 playoffs come to an end. Uh, I didn't even think about Deshaun to New Orleans. I was thinking maybe Deshaun maybe to L.A., to the Rams, uh, maybe back home to Atlanta with the Falcons if they get rid of Matt Ryan. I don't know. But if he did go to the Saints, that would be crazy, man. We got to put them up with the favors next year if he goes there, man. I, I think Drew, I think Drew Brees has the weight of the universe on his shoulders because I I I simply believe that they're moving on from Brees if they, if this doesn't work out. How many times are you going to keep trying and trying to get over that hump? What if you want to look at all the games that he's missing with that rib injury? How healthy is he right now? The exactly, Chicago Bears, exactly. team, the Chicago Bears, I do not believe would belong on the same field as the New Orleans Saints. No way. Mr. Mr. Bisky's terrible. I don't know how else to say it straight up. <laughs> they traded up. Yes, Bears fans, who's ever watching, I'll remind you again. Traded up to pass on not only Deshaun Watson, you passed on Patrick Mahomes to take a UNC quarterback who's been a total bust. The Saints should beat the brakes off a team like the Chicago Bears. And then people are worried about the Bucs the way they only beat a backup quarterback with the against Washington. So are both these teams really struggling right now? Is it just that we don't trust any team in the NFC, but the, the Bucs had an ugly win? And the Saints didn't have a great win as well. What What are your thoughts on that? Or should both teams be overly concerned or a division rival? But you got to look at how the Bucks have been playing. They are starting to click all the way in all cylinders. I don't care who they were playing. Of course, the Bears suck. Like, the Bears, that's a practice round. You know, that's a scrimmage. Uh, they give them the first round, basically. But the Buccaneers, like, they're just – Tom Brady, man, like you said, I just trust Tom Brady to get it done. This guy has been here before. He's won six rings. <laughs> Nobody's ever won six rings. This guy knows what to do. I know he's 43, but he's looking great at 43. He's the best 43 year old I've ever seen. So I, you know, I trust the Bucs. I just don't think the Saints are going to beat the Bucs, man. I just don't see it. Yeah, let's give credit where credit's due. Washington had a pretty good defense. Yeah, Tom Brady kind of excelled against that defense, but that was a tough defense he played last week on the road. And he's going to play another tough defense against the New Orleans Saints. But, yeah, I mean, just, you know, both teams have kind of gone off to slow starts. I think this one will come down to whoever sets the tone earlier, which, you know, if you ask me, I think it'll be Tampa Bay. Their passing attack has been really at a, playing at a high level the past few weeks. We'll see what Rojo looks like. But even if he can't go, Leonard Fournette looked pretty great last week. So, you know, if Tampa Bay gets off and going early and the Saints have to play catch up, then, you know, I think it's Tampa Bay that's moving on. So it seems you both think, believe that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers will move on to the NFC Championship. With that being said, again, Brady's 43 years old. Does he have one last Super Bowl run in him? Will he get to his 10th? Will he win his 7th? What are your thoughts on that? Do you feel confident to pick them right now? I don't. Um, I still think we have one more game to cover, and I still think that the Green Bay Packers are the team to beat especially going into Lambeau Field where Aaron Rodgers plays nearly flawless football. I'll, I'll say some of that for later. But, you know, I mean, again, give credit where credit is due. Bruce Arians came into this Tampa Bay team, kind of whipped them into shape from Jameis Winston to Tom Brady. Um, they've looked great the past few weeks to end the season. They look great. You know, they look pretty good against Washington. It was a little scary. They had Washington had a chance to tie that game at the end of that one. But, um, yeah, it comes back to, like we said, the trust factor is with Brady. He's either going to win you the game or he's going to lose you the game. It's going to come down to his arm. I think they'll get past New Orleans, but I think they'll fall just short of being the first team to host the Super Bowl game. I got them hosting the Super Bowl because, as you guys know, football in the field is all about timing and momentum. And I just think Tampa Bay has all the momentum. And they got something to look forward to. You know, playing a Super Bowl in your home stadium, that's crazy. So. If anybody can get the job done, I trust Tom. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a big Tom Brady fan. Like, I've seen this guy. You know, we've all seen this. Coming back 28-3 to on the Falcons. Um, countless. Countless. I just got Tampa Bay. I just feel I just feel that in my gut. I'm, tamp I'm taking Tampa to win. I mean, w get out of the NFC and, yeah, ho host the Super Bowl for the first time in NFL history. 
It's something about the Packers that's hard for me to trust and believe in right now. Time and time again, we think that the Packers are going to the Super Bowl. It's happened multiple years since they made it. Winning MVP in 2011, they get upset by the Giants super unexpectedly. Then it happens last year. There wasn't an upset, but people were picking the Packers last year against the 49ers. I feel like there's just too many times that we thought that the Packers were going to be that team, and they simply disappointed us. Defensively, sure, they looked good. Devontae Adams, man, like that is a tough guy for any team to match up against. But with that being said, it's really tough to bet against this Buccaneers team when they're firing at all cylinders. You got the greatest quarterback of all time who still looks like he's got plenty left in him. I mean, just think about it. 5,000 yards, 43 touchdowns at age 43. His contract expires after next year, and I think he's got another few years left in him. He really doesn't look like he's slowing down. As long as an offensive line can protect him, he still looks like he could get a few more years left. And really, he's defeated father time. It looks like that's going to come more for sure. So with that being said, I am taking the Bucks another upset, and the Bucks will go on to the NFC Championship, and I am picking them to reach the Super Bowl. But with that being said, I want to switch topics real quick. We're going to go to the Packers versus the Rams. What are your thoughts on that? Are the Packers on upset alert, or do the Rams got this? No, no absolutely not. not. Green Bay, like you said, Devontae Adams and Aaron Rodgers have that special connection. You know, they've torched almost every team they've played this year. Yeah, the Rams do have the number one defense, and Jalen Ramsey is going to be a tough test for Adams. But Adams is just – he's beaten every defender he's lined up against this season. Um, you know, if I'm a betting man, I bet on the Packers that win this game. I uh, think it's another statement for touchdown game for MVP to be Aaron Rodgers. I mean, come on, man. The, the, the Rams are beating the Packers, man. <laughs> it's not happening. I mean, the starting quarterback didn't even start last week. And he barely – he only played because the other guy, Wofford, got sent to the hospital, man. So, that situation is not even – that's iffy right there. So, I just I just see Rodgers just tearing them up. I know they have Jalen Rams and they got Aaron Donald. They got all these guys on defense. Their defense is pretty good, but I just got the Packers winning that. Well, unexpectedly, it's going to happen. I'm taking the Rams to defeat the Packers. We say this, we see this movie too often. We see this movie too often with the Packers, where we think this is the year Rodgers is going to make his mark because the all time great surpass Tom Brady. They're going to get it done. It's not this year, and it's ending this weekend. A few things <laughs> defense wins championships, offense wins games. Jalen yeah. Ramsey yeah. has been. He is the best cornerback in the NFL, and I don't believe he's actually getting the respect he deserves. I feel like ever since Jacksonville made that AFC Championship game, people really looked at him that high, but once he demanded that trade, people started to look down on him. They didn't look give him the same energy as he did when he was in Jacksonville. He is still a bad dude, the best cornerback in the game. And you ever notice DK Metcalf? Again, top three wide receiver if you ask me. Jalen Ramsey locked him up. Why can't he do that against Devontae Adams? Sure, Devontae Adams, if you want to say, is better than DK Metcalf. I'm not going to have that much of an argument with him. The back shoulder fade is just virtually unguardable. You can always look to double Devontae, but that defense is legit. Aaron Donald, he's playing. He's officially playing. Him putting pressure on Rodgers, and then you have Jalen Ramsey shadowing Devontae Adams. That is a great way to contain that Packers offense. I believe that the bye week, having a bye week is bittersweet. Of course, you advance the next round without playing the wild card weekend. You could get healthier. But also, some teams need to keep playing to keep that momentum going. Once you have that long break, it feels like you lost. It feels like the, it feels like the Packers haven't played in forever because they just missed one week. It feels like a long time. So that... Bye week is a little bit bittersweet, if you're going to ask me. I believe defense is going to set the tone. They're going to contain the Packers. And the Packers have had a history of having defensive fiascos in the playoffs. Eli Manning's done it to them. Uh, the 49ers ran all over them last year. Yeah, last year. Look, last year, look what yeah. Cam Akers did last, last week against the Seahawks, especially in that second quarter. Sure, Wilson had a brutal interception, like six inches across the line of scrimmage. 
But I, I like the Rams in this game. I think Cam Akers, Akers is going to set the tone. Jared Goff will get the start. As long as he takes care of the football, could put up some points, put the de- and the defense does their job, that's where I see this upset happening. There's, I feel like another thing, people are big believers that when you're on the cover of Madden, it's cursed. I'm kind of with that with the MVP as well. When you win MVP in this league, something always happens where you come up short or you don't win the championship. That's with the Green Bay Packers this year. The matchup-wise, again, I like what the Rams got. I wanted to pick the Rams at one point in these during the regular season to be the favorite in the NFC. And then they wet the bed against the Jets. And then it's like, all right, wow, I don't know what to expect now. Then I said this is all wide open. But with a big win last week, with their backup quarterback getting hurt and Jared Goff coming in and getting the job done and what their defense did, Rams in an upset. Thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, if the Rams are going to do the upset, it's going to be more or less the same game plan they had against Seattle. Run the ball, have Aaron Donald, you know, wreck havoc in the backfield, and Jalen Ramsey is going to shut down Devontae Adams. However, I just I, I don't see it. I think you just you trust. If you want to go back to that trust factor, you trust Aaron Rodgers at home, who hasn't lost a playoff game in Lambeau Field in over four seasons now. And if the cold weather does take effect, Aaron Rodgers is 10-0 and in his last cold weather games where it's below freezing. So you take a West Coast team that's coming to play. You know, it's a long flight coming to play, and, and forecast doesn't seem like it'll be too treacherous. But let's just say a cold weather game. You know, Jared Goff has been Jekyll or Hyde this season. He's looked great, good, to pretty brutal, awful. So, you know, we'll see what he looks like when they play the Packers. But this is a team, this is a Green Bay team that has a one hell of an offensive line that should do a pretty good job on Aaron Donald, who's already coming injured into this game. Aaron Jones is slighted to have potentially a big game. Devontae Adams. Even if you cover Adams, you still have a pretty good tight end and Robert Tunyon. And BS could go off. I mean, there's just, I think there's too many factors for Green Bay to choke this game away. Not to discredit Los Angeles by any means, but Los Angeles is going to have to have nearly a perfect, more perfect than they had last week against Seattle if they're going to complete the upset tomorrow. Yeah, I'm sticking with my Packers pick, but like you said, that um, that Devontae Adams-Jalen Ramsey matchup is must-see TV. I, I'm really looking forward to that. I don't think I, I don't think Devontae Adams is going to get off on him like that. Jalen Ramsey is, is fast, he's big, he's physical. Um, like you said, he shut down DK Metcalf last week. Um, fairly easily. So I I don't see him just going off. I think somebody else is going to have to beat the Rams for them to get it done. You know? That's going to wrap up this topic. One more game we have to cover. It looks like we know who's going to win. The Chiefs and the Browns. The Chiefs, we, ad- we address that they look like they got the best quarterback in the game. They got the best, still the best offense in the league. But the Cleveland Browns, hey, they had a monster win against Pittsburgh. Some people thought that was unexpected. I picked the Browns. I just need to give myself my flowers. But do the Chiefs – Is there, are, are the Chiefs on upset alert? Or can we – and can we look at them and look ahead and say they're a lot to repeat as Super Bowl champions? Rob, we'll start with you. What do you think about that? Upset upset alert. I'm picking the Browns, man. And I'm not even a Browns fan. I'm from Cleveland. <laughs> I'm from Cleveland. I, they showed me something last week, man. They showed me something last week. That defense looked great. That offense looked great. Um, but like I said, the key to the Browns beating the Chiefs is they got to get turnovers and they got to get points off those turnovers, whether that's a fumble recovery taking it to the end zone, whether that's some kind of pick six against my home. Something has to happen to go their way for, the, that, for that to happen. If they just play straight up, they're not beating the Chiefs. You already know that. Chiefs is putting that points quick. Well, hold on. How, how, can, how, can we say about the, how can we say about the turnovers or whatever when Mahomes doesn't make mistakes? Sure, you can make the argument that he didn't look up to par the last few games, but overall the kid does not make mistakes. I believe he had six interceptions, which is the second least in the NFL behind Rodgers. So, I mean, you can't go into a game and bank on turnovers. Like, winning the turnover battle against the Chiefs is close to impossible. It's exactly. very exactly. unlikely. With Baker, who has a history of turnovers, bad, bad decisions with the football, bad pocket awareness, gets stripped a lot. So, how are you going to try to make an argument that we're going to bank on getting turnovers or win the turnover battle or something amongst those lines? Uh, the Browns look good, man. Just don't don't sleep on them, man. Don't sleep on them. You saw what happened last week. Everybody slept on them last week. What happened? You know, Pittsburgh started off 11-0. and 
and where they're at now, sitting on the couch like I'm doing right now. Hold on. The, the Steelers do like to turn the Chiefs. They, they, we knew the Steelers were pretenders. I, I posted in week 11, I said, this Pittsburgh Steelers team doesn't have that same feel as the Brady Patriots did when they had long stretches of being undefeated, when the Manning Colts had long stretches of being undefeated. Like you, We felt that around the league where it's, it's Indianapolis and then it's everybody else. Like This is the team to beat. The Patriots, we know that they've always been the team to beat when they've had long stretches of undefeated. The Steelers, when you looked at their schedule, it's like you had a cupcake schedule. You had ugly wins. I always refer to Ben Roethlisberger as he's as mobile as the tin man in the pocket. Their running game is in the toilet bowl. They have injuries in the linebacking core. Their corners have not looked great. So you knew them struggling entering the postseason that something just wasn't right. This is not the Kansas. That's not the Kansas City Chiefs. The best quarterback in the game, Andy Reid, in my eyes, maybe the best coach in the NFL. The duel of Kelsey and Tyreek Hill, their running game, I don't think the Browns could compete with that. No way, no how. David, I want to get your thoughts, though. Yeah, sure. If you're going to use the momentum argument for Green Bay, then you have to use the momentum argument for Kansas City as well. They haven't, they didn't look good to end the season, and they had the other bye week as well. So you will have to question how they, how they get off to this game against the Browns. I will say that Cleveland does have the formula. If there's one big key upset that they do have, and that's that's going to be controlling the ground game, right? They have the one-two punch of Chubb and Hunt to keep Mahomes off the sides, you know, off the ball. And, you know, they're going to need to score points. It's not going to be like Pittsburgh where, you know, Mayfield's going to drop back and hit Jarvis Landry and he's going to take it to the house each time. They're going to, they're going to need to match points with Kansas City, but I like Kansas City too much. They're too well coached of a team. Even if Mahomes, you know, 50% Mahomes' power is still an MVP-type performance. You know, as long as he gets it going, you know, you trust Hill, you trust Kelsey. You know, we'll see what we get out of, you know, CEH, Le'Veon Bell. I mean, they just, there's too many, just too much star power on this team to not pick Kansas City. Right. I'm absolutely going to take the Kansas City Chiefs in this game. I always tell people, there's one way the Chiefs can be defeated. But the problem with that is they do this really well. The way to beat them is beat them in a shootout, which I don't believe there's anyone who could really go toe-to-toe with Patrick Mahomes if you're going to go for a shootout. Baker Mayfield is not that duo. Is not that dude. Sure, the running back duo could set the tone because the Chiefs have an awful run defense. That is the Browns' only path to victory. It set the tone early with Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. If they could run the ball, it'll open things up for Baker. And that Chiefs defense is just all not that great. What's scaring me about the Chiefs a little bit is that defense is looking like the 2018 defense when they were 31st in the NFL. And the only reason why they did not win the Super Bowl that year when they lost in the AFC Championship game against Tom Brady and those New England Patriots. That's the only reason why they didn't make it. I'm getting a little worried. It's that same defense right now, especially running the ball against the Cleveland Browns. I'm not betting against Mahomes like I won't bet against Brady. Those two guys I still can't bet against. But the thing is, the Browns want to do this. It's got to be a shootout. It's got to start with Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. If they could get up early and put points early, then they have a fighter's chance. But I think that is their last and only hurrah to do that. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, when you're the Super Bowl champs, you know, all eyes on you. You've got the bullseye in the back of you. And, yeah, the their ground game is going to have to get off to a great start. You know, Baker Mayfield – on the road with a chance to go to the title game, has is probably going to have to play near-perfect football. I mean, he cannot turn over this ball. And if, you know, Miles Garrett and company can't contain Mahomes and Mahomes has a hot hand like we've seen before, you know, this one could be over by halftime. You look back at that Texans-Chiefs game, and, yeah, I mean, just sometimes this team is just impossible to stop on offense. That defense is a little scary, I will admit. Um, you know, that – is probably what does give Cleveland a little hope if they're going to complete this mega upset is that they can take advantage against this Chiefs defense. But like I said, this there's too much power. I think if it gets to a shootout, this one yeah, clearly favors Mahomes and company. Rob? Yeah, that's the thing. Even if the Browns get up, you know, we've seen this before. Mahomes has the ability to really come back and come back quickly. So the Browns have to play – Damn near a perfect game, if not a perfect game, to beat the Chiefs. But as you saw last week, I want, I don't know if that was perfect, but <laughs> I was damn sure close. So if they can do something like that last, like they did last week, I know they're not going to score 28. 
to zero in the first quarter. That's probably not going to happen against the Chiefs. But, but, you know, if they can control that ground game, if they can play defense on Mahomes, kind of contain them, they can make it happen, man. Yeah, Big Ben threw, what, 500 yards? And somewhat well, those stats don't, 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 those so. stats aren't really fine. That's, all, that's, that's <laughs> garbage time. Yo. Those are garbage time stats. It's called space. You know what I mean? so, but to, to speak, to, to wrap up today's football segments, are the Chiefs a lot to repeat? I mean, the best quarterback in the game, the best offense in the game. Are they the are they the favorites? Like, I mean, not not necessarily. The, of course, they're the favorites, but are they a lock? Is it really? There's no team that's left could really beat them. What are your thoughts? Final thoughts on that before we wrap up. Buffalo, I think, probably has the best chance of the AFC teams to knock off KC before they get to the Super Bowl. You know, I like Josh Allen a lot. That that Diggs Allen connection is special. If they're a good defensive unit, you know, but a lot of teams. Whoever it is going into the AFC title game will have to do the impossible if it's against Kansas City and knock them off. Can they repeat as Super Bowl champs? Of course they can. Will they? I'm going to say no this year. I think uh, I think a Super Bowl winner will come from the NFC this season. I'm picking the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to win the Super Bowl. No way. I'm I'm, st- I'm sticking with Kansas City. <laughs> Too much firepower. You cannot you cannot ever bet against the greatest player in the game at Pat Mahomes. We've seen the comebacks. We've seen how dynamic Andy Reid's playbook is between the duo of Tyreek and Travis Kelsey, the running game. The Chiefs have too much for any team to compete against. I am picking the Chiefs to win it all, repeat again, and Mahomes will really put himself in a class by himself, repeating as Super Bowl champions. And then the conversation is really going to kick up if he could catch Brady. But that's going to wrap up the NFL today. I want to thank Rob and David for joining me. I believe, Rob, you're sticking around for some NBA and then David, David, David's going to head out, but David, I want to thank you for joining me. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on, guys. So I, I want to I I talk on some NBA. What, what do we think on James Harden to the Brooklyn Nets? What, what, are, your, what are your thoughts on that? To be honest, I, I kind of find it very difficult as to how people are – I mean, I've just been seeing on Twitter. I've been seeing on social media. People are so easy to say that the Rockets won the trade. Maybe the Pacers won the trade. Um, in my opinion, the Nets won the trade. You don't you don't get a top five player in the NBA uh, and not win the trade. You and then you have him for maybe two more years. Um, I know everyone loves to loves to put an asterisk and say, "Oh, what about Kyrie? Kyrie's been you know grumbling a little bit. He's been upset. He hasn't been playing." So okay, let me let me tell you this. Worst case scenario, Kyrie Irving chooses that he doesn't want to play for this team anymore. He doesn't want to play basketball anymore. Um, and then his contract is going to get voided his contract is going to get diminished that leaves you with 35 mil in annual cap space going forward all those pieces that you gave up to get james harden they give, give they give up key pieces like jared allen torian prince karis lever all guys who are very very key quality guys the guys you'll need especially in playoff basketball you can maybe go into the market and get somebody i'm not exactly sure how the contracts are going to work but hey maybe you add an andre drummond to your team for that one year to you know really fill up that center spot that's been a, that's a bit thin now because because Jared Allen is gone, uh, maybe you add a few defensive wings, D and three guys, uh, three and D guys. Uh, so for me personally, did the did the Rockets get worse? No. Did the Pacers get worse? No. Did the Cavs get worse? Definitely not. But in my opinion, you can't go against a team that has three of the arguable arguably top ten players in the NBA, let alone two guys that are top five. So in my opinion, the Nets definitely won this trade. To me, their finals bound, regardless of what any other team in the East does throughout the season. Faye? Yeah, I might have to respectfully disagree on that one because I actually think Indiana, the, the Pacers won that trade. Uh, but we'll break it down first. We'll go with why I don't think the Brooklyn Nets won the trade. The Brooklyn Nets, man, like they were prized on their depth. Everyone talked about the Nets having, you know, one through 10. They were, they made the playoffs last year and then they pretty much just added Kyrie and KD to a team that already made the playoffs, right? So they had a pretty good chemistry. Let's go with that. They had good chemistry. They played well together. They made the playoffs. They they were out in the first round, but they made the playoffs. So you had KD and Kyrie to the mix, and then you have guys like Dinwiddie, Jared Allen, Karis LeVert, um, you name it, right? And then all those guys are now gone. Spencer Dinwiddie's out the season on injury. And then you get away. You give away Karis LeVert, who's your only your only real bench production guy, um, but consistent production guy off the bench. And then you lose Jared Allen, who I think everyone in the basketball world outside of Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving think or agree 
that Jared Allen is a much better player than DeAndre Jordan. Um, you give away a young guy who's very bright. He's 22 years old. He's much better. He's a better defender. He's more athletic, in my opinion. Just a better, more bright future of a player. Uh, but you stick with DeAndre Jordan. You have three guys that are making over $30 million. So you're you're pretty stuck on how you can back that team up. And then, Zaid, you brought up the point. You can't really go against a team that has three great players, arguably two, two of the top five. I, I would absolutely say that you can in this case because, A, Kyrie Irving is not just – his attendance is not just flaky in his, his commitment. That's one thing. Like, for you to win a championship, everyone's got to be on the same page. You know, you hear all these guys talking about the team chemistry and what you have to go through in the adversity, especially this year with COVID-19, all the different curveballs that are thrown at you, man. Anything can happen, right? And you have to have a strong bond. And with Kyrie being distracted and all this, I don't think he's there. And it, even if he is there – there's a good statistical chance that he's going to be injured around playoff time. Like, let's just look at his history. He's not a healthy player. And he, every year, he's not healthy in the playoffs. He misses playoffs after playoffs. And I don't think he's had a good playoff run since the Cleveland Cavaliers. So let's not. And then, I mean, KD is coming back from an Achilles injury to, to trust that he's going to be 100% through the season. Like, I would hope so. And he looks great right now. But, I mean, and let's, let's call it what it is. James Harden had a good offseason. He ate a lot in the offseason. That's just a fact. And he, like, I understand it. It's a good, it was a summer, whatever. You were in the bubble or one night, you're out. You're like, yo, I'm, I'm off this. I'm, I'm off this, you know, organize, organization's food. I'm, I'm just going to go do my own thing. And he came back. He's out of shape. I mean, he had a great first couple of games, but he's still out of shape. There's still, there's a lot to get figured out. And it's, it's not as clear cut. Uh, but then you look at the Pacers already having a great team and they're looking very well coached winning a lot of games. They, they just beat Portland on the road by 20 last night the, on a back-to-back -back after beating Golden State on the road. Uh, and they're, I think, second or third in the East right now, depending on where the standing was last night. But they're right up there, and they're well-coached. And then they have Karis LeVert. And you have TJ Warren coming back from injury at some point this season. Like The depth on that team, they're well-coached. I think that they won that trade ultimately. And then Houston, I mean, Houston got a boatload of picks. We can talk about that, but... I mean, Old Depot's not really going to stay, and there's I, I don't trust that one. So that's how I feel about the trade. I'm not really sold on the Brooklyn Nets as, as most people could or might be. Rob, hey, what's up, guys? Um, of course, I mean, of course, Brooklyn won the trade. You got Harden, Durant, and Kyrie on the same team, but you got to remember, there's one basketball, and these guys are all, all individual ISO players. Kevin Durant. He wants to ISO. Harden definitely wants to ISO and pound the ball into the ground. That's what he does and want to clear everybody out. All that's going to have to stop. That's not going to happen. Like, KD's not letting him do that. And Kyrie is going to be pissed off. You know, I'm from Cleveland. You know, I covered the Cavs. So, um, you know, I saw Kyrie with LeBron for three years. Um, and I saw Kyrie before that. So, Kyrie always has some kind of issue popping up where his father is talking shit or some, something's always going on with Kyrie, man. It's never just smooth to go out there and just do your damn job. Like, it's always something with Kyrie. So, Kyrie and James, even though, the, you know, these guys have been around each other since, you know, they were younger and USA basketball and all that, but playing on the same NBA team is a different beast. I don't see the Nets making it out the East, man. Hold on. I got to eat now. A few things. <laughs> I, I love this trade for basketball reasons. This I think we are on pace – to have one of the greatest finals matchups in our lifetime. The Lakers and the Nets, this is going to be a dogfight of a series, and I think this is going to be a seven-game series, which as sports fans, especially as guys no, in the media, no. we should – Yes, stop <laughs> it. Zip it. Zip it. That's absolutely what I see right here. Before the season started, I had a take. The Nets would start 8-7. and seven. I'm on cue right now as we speak. Did it go exactly how I thought? No, but it looks like they're going to be at 8-7. and seven. A slow start. I said everyone in the world will panic except me, and I'll be right at the end. And I said once the playoffs come, they will coast through the Eastern Conference playoffs in 15 games or less. And I still stand by that right now. A few things. I think their slow start is going to prolong a little bit more. Because you have now the three best ISO scores in the league. I think that I think we could all agree on the three best ISO scores are Harden, Durant, Irving. All of them. What they can do with the ball in their hands going one-on-one, -on -one, they are virtually all unguardable. I think it's going to be a chemistry experiment, which will be the biggest thing with this. Sure, it may make time to gel and figure this out. I think a guy like Harden is going to have to take his points per game down that he had in Houston. 
about 10 points per game less. I think he's got to average between the 26, 27 range instead of that 34, 36, which we've seen the past two years. I think his shot quality needs to increase, but his shot quantity needs to decrease. Uh, that I, that his shot quality needs to increase. His shot quantity needs to decrease. That's what I think Harden's role. I think he's going to have to play more of that point guard role, have the ball in his hands, playmake for his other guys, because out of the three, he's definitely the best playmaker. Kyrie's just going to have to be used as a weapon. Sure, everyone's making a big deal that he's been missing in action. No idea why. In the words of Aaron Rodgers, my favorite quote, it's my new favorite quote now. Once upon a time, he said, R-E-L. A X. Relax. It's going to be okay. We've seen too many championship caliber teams start this slow. And everyone in the media and all the fans on social media will react. I am old enough and I've been following this league long enough to not oh, to overreact to teams with slow starts. We've seen the my, the big three Miami Heatles do it when they got together. We've seen the Cavs when LeBron first got back there. And then we saw when Kyrie left LeBron. I remember in the month of January, LeBron had the lowest box score plus minus in his entire career. The Cavs did not play any defense. They hated each other. People said on national television the Cavs should have traded LeBron right there, which is just one of the most outlandish things. And people were questioning if they would even make the playoffs. They ended up going to the finals. The Nets have so much talent. Sure, this is not 2K where you could just stack up your best teams and it's just going to work because you have great players on your team. I understand that it's about chemistry. It's about gelling. It's knowing how to learn to play together. Sure, that's going to be a big factor, figuring it out towards the postseason. But you got to look at this as when you have that much talent, talent is just going to override other teams in the sport of basketball. When you're just superior to other teams, you are going to beat them. I've been saying all year long, and sure, I forget who said talked about the depth, which I totally agree, which is why I was so high in the Nets. Dinwiddie, a, a true point guard. He averaged 20-6 and six last year. Karis LeVert gave you 18 points a game last year. Jared Allen, great rim protector. Sure, totally agree with that. With Harden, Irving, and Durant all on one team, they will figure it out eventually. Just talent overrides other talent, period, point blank. This is the sport of basketball we're talking about. I've been asking a lot of people, Name me one team in the East that is going to beat them or push them six games. Literally six games. It's not happening. There's nobody in the East who could really compete with them. And I dare someone to make an argument with me. Someone, someone make an argument why a team could beat the Brooklyn Nets. Because I'm telling you right now, it's not happening unless injury. The floor is yours. Who wants to go? <laughs> this guy said that they won't even get pushed six games, he said. The Brooklyn Nets will get pushed six games. That's assuming Kyrie's around come that time in the first place. That's a huge assumption on its own. But after the three, can we discuss Brooklyn after their their top three? Can we talk about the team? DeAndre Jordan, Jeff Green? Joe Harris. Joe Harris. See, Joe Harris is a sniper. DeAndre Jordan is still a solid rip protector. Jeff Green, sure, he's not the Karis of Arter Spencer. (laughs) I believe Jeff Green's a nice piece. The Nets are, sure, they're a top-heavy team. How many top-heavy teams do we see win the title? Sure, they're, are they the Golden State Warriors? No, they're not. Look at the 2016 Cavs, super top-heavy. It's LeBron, Kyrie, and a bunch of cadavers. Yes, I'm not including Kevin Love. Kevin Love is extremely overrated. We could talk about it another day. Cadavers? We seen, oh, oh, 100%. We've seen the Miami Heatles with LeBron, Wade, and Bosch. They weren't a deep team. Sure, they had, they had some sharpshooters who... With LeBron, Wade, and Bosh were able to create them good looks. So you got to look at it like this. As far as basketball goes, NBA goes, it's all about team chemistry. The reason why the Warriors won when Durant went there is because he bought into what they were already doing. Steph and Clay are snipers. Then they have everybody else helping out. Draymond Green is playing point forward, basically. The Nets have three players that play the same way. So you're just automatically saying that they're going to go to the finals? And go seven with the late. They will not, they will go, not seven go seven, wrong seven with the Lakers. Wrong. They don't play all the same way. Durant has proven he could play off the ball. He can move without the ball. Sure, he could. Uh, he could ISO score better than almost anybody in the league. One of the best pure scores in NBA history. Sure, exactly. I would exactly. not. I would not compare all their games the same. Sure, there's some similarities in it because they're such great ISO scores. Kyrie, the best ball handler we've ever seen in our lifetime. Sure, he's a great ISO scorer. Shoot from three point range. Pull up on the dime from mid range. Finish under the rim better than anybody. 
He's not a great playmaker either. He's pretty much just a scorer. Kyrie's going to have to take a backseat a little bit, and so is Harden. I believe this is still Durant's team. He's got to be the best player. He should be the leading scorer, taking the most shots. I believe Kyrie's just going to have to be the – I think Kyrie's going to have to be the third option. On this. Kyrie Irving is not going to want to take a backseat. You know, I saw him in Cleveland. He had a problem taking a backseat in Cleveland, which is why he requested the trade. Kyrie Irving is not going to want to take a back seat. Why is he with Durant? Then? Why if he didn't want to take a back seat? Then why is he with Durant? He, he sees he sees himself as Durant's equal. He sees himself as these guys equal. He is not taking a back seat. So they're just going to figure it out. And I don't know I don't if they're going to be able to figure it out. So do you think Kyrie plays? As long as he tests negative, he's coming back. Yeah, he's so coming he's back. back. You, have you, to, you have to mess around with his bag. bag. They mess around with his bag, right? When they find him the money, then he's like, yeah, I got to come back now. But yeah, that like <laughs> Rob Rob made a great point, man. He got to buy in, and at the end of the day, he left Cleveland because he didn't want to be second to LeBron. He left. It didn't work out in Boston because he couldn't couldn't fathom the fact that his young buck from Duke is his equal, if not the guy that you should at least start going more to. And Jalen Brown and was Jaylen an afterthought for Kyrie. You know what I mean? And guys like Marcus Smart, they're not going to take crap from, from a guy like Kyrie. So it, that didn't work out. So he goes to Brooklyn, and like Rob said, he thinks he's his equal. He went on live. He said, in my past life, I was you. KD's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> in what life were you me? <laughs> Absolutely not. And then what happens? Kyrie disappears for six games. Uh, then he comes back. Oh, and then there's reports. I was going to ask you. The reports that are coming out that are saying Kyrie was unhappy with uh, the way that they went about hiring the head coach. He wasn't on board with Steve Nash, and he was not on board with them bringing in Harden. So what does that mean for the team, man? I think it's all overhyped. It's a storyline. They're going to figure it out. We, we've just seen this too many times with teams who struggle early. They have, quote-unquote, chemistry issues, and they figure it out later in the year. When you just have that much talent, like, they are so talented. I still just be I believe in talent. I believe Harden's going to figure it out. I, again, if they finish with the four or five seed in the Eastern Conference, I will not be surprised. I will have my same take of how fast they will get to the finals. They're doing that as long as they are healthy. They're too talented. It's gonna this whole season is gonna be Steve Nash figuring out how to deal with these stars, which Durant definitely was a huge part of that signing. And Durant and Kyrie are boys. So do I believe that Kyrie had nothing to do with Steve Nash hiring? Not really. I kind of almost think it's a little bit of a storyline if you're going to ask me. They're going to figure it out. You have all the talent in the world on that team, and there is no reason why to doubt this Brooklyn Nets team because there's nobody in the East who could even compete with them. I got Philly. Really? You're going to tell no, me no. the straight face of the Philadelphia 76ers? They, Doc Doc River, Philly is a different team, and size, they don't even come close. It's not Doc even Rivers close. is terrible. Nah, he's he's good, blown bro. three one leads. Even if they're okay, winning, the okay, series, he's, he's blown three it. one leads. Sure, but he's statistically doing much better with this team this, this year. They look like a different group. Yeah, they haven't had a lot of players in the last week. They're deep. They're they have size. And I'm just saying, for you guys to completely dismiss teams like Philly, teams yeah, like yeah. Milwaukee, teams like teams like Indiana who just stocked up, and you're gonna say, "Oh, Brooklyn's got it all." Why? At least these teams are fluid right now. At least they're playing as a unit right now. Everyone's bought in. Brooklyn has way more to overcome before they can even get to that level. And you guys are going to tell me, oh, by the time the playoffs come in a shortened season that they're going to just have it all figured out. And you don't think by the end of the year, Kyrie's going to get quarantined at least two more times, miss like five, six <laughs> more games. Come on, guys. No, that, that, no, that's no, got, no. that's got to be one of the worst takes I've, I've heard on this. Oh, oh, hold, on, hold on. The f you don't, and you, and you can tell you don't even believe that you're just trying to say it to not be vanilla. You do not believe that the Milwaukee Bucks, if you want to try to make an argument, the, the Bucks will try to be, that will beat the Nets. I'll, I'll debunk that. Can you tell me about James Harden's playoff performances in the past five years? He's had flukes in the playoffs, sure. And he's also played very well in the playoffs. You want to talk about Giannis Antetokounmpo's playoffs? I could do that real quick if you need me to. You want me to? Let me take you down memory lane because if people remember when this when the season got suspended in March, it actually came back in the summer. Maybe my T... I watched my games on Roku. Maybe if you watch on cable versus Roku, my TV may have showed me something different. But I can tell you what my TV showed me. So my TV showed me game one against the number five seed Miami Heat. The Bucks were up 96 to 95 with about six minutes remaining. The back-to-back -back MVP goes 0 for 1 with one point the rest of the game, and they lose. They go down one nothing. What about game two? A time to a uh, time that you could turn the series around, right? They play catch up all game long. The fourth quarter comes. You have a four to five minute stretch where the Bucks as a team do not score a single point. Again, this is under the back-to-back -back MVPs. Watch 
Two nothing. Okay, you have one last hurrah to turn this series around. Game three, up eighty-seven to seventy-five going into the fourth quarter. Looks like the Bucks have full control of that game. What happens? The Bucks get outscored forty to thirteen. Giannis has four fourth quarter points. He had a box score plus minus of that game of negative twenty-five. And that guy, you're going to tell me, is going to figure it out in the postseason when he is a literally a he is more of a liability than an asset in the half court in second half of playoff games. That is a fact. That is not my opinion. There's factual evidence. Guess to what? Back Guess what? Wait, wait, he wait, wants wait, to. Wait. When teams know how to game plan and build a wall, he gives you nothing. He can't facts, shoot. Facts. He can't drive when there's building a wall. He can't play make. He can't go in the post. He gives you nothing. And your second best option is Chris. Middleton, who again, he's proven that he's not a very clutch player. I never once said Milwaukee's making the finals, guys. All I'm saying is it's not a shoe in for Brooklyn when yes, you it have is. Yes, four it is. Five Nobody can beat good. them. Nobody has, besides injury or COVID tests on their side, there's no team that's actually. My, 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 I got Miami right there at the end. Not enough star power. Oh, there. Uh, Give me one logical reason how the Sixers will beat the Nets in, in the in the seven game series. Because on. I I, I believe that the Sixers. I don't I don't think that they'll beat them. But to say that they can't compete is just blasphemy. Because Tobias Harris played his last amazing season, the one he got paid under Doc Rivers. Look at his numbers this season. He's back to being productive. Joel Embiid is playing out of his mind. Ben Simmons is playing well, and they have depth. Seth Curry is having a career season. Shake Milton is having a career season. These guys yeah, have played together. There's game. chemistry. They can compete. So for you to come tell me all these teams are nothing, Brooklyn is not ahead above anybody, and we will come back. I We will come back here when Brooklyn's out in the second round this season. Oh, yeah. And we're going to have this time. <laughs> wait, wait, all right. Yeah, first, first of all, first of all wait, wake me up when the Nets lose. I'll, I'll be having a really long hey, Let's talk about the Sixers in context because that argument was awful. Joel Embiid, tons of tummy aches. He could have a tummy ache come the postseason. And then what? He may have to take off. That's number one. That's number one. What, uh, superstars need to play about 42 to 45 minutes a game in a postseason to win a playoff series against top teams, which we know Embiid will certainly not do that, who has a history of injuries. Ben Simmons, great player, sure. Another guy who's not very good in the backcourt, in the half court, excuse me. How what is he gonna do in terms of crunch time? He's a Shut liability. Down, he's a liability at the free throw line. Sure. Hold on. First of all, got, those got, superstars got, can't be quarter? guarded. Could he contain them throughout a game? Maybe in the fourth quarter. The superstars are gonna get theirs. Kyrie's gonna get his. Durant is gonna get his. Unguardable. Harden, again, they're gonna get theirs. They're Kyrie and Durant are two guys proven closers. Could hit the clutch shot in the big moment. There's no way you could actually believe that the Sixers. Because Ben Simmons, Ben Simmons, sure, he does everything without a jump shot, but that jump shot's really critical, especially that he can't get it done at the free throw line, which we know important free throws are in late in games. That's first of all. Tobias Harris, could you could you explain to me what he did last year in the playoffs? I'll wait. I never said last year. I said the last year he played under Doc Rivers. It's about he the had Clippers, his yeah. Best season. And then he got paid, and now he's playing under Doc Rivers, and again, back to being productive. I acknowledge he wasn't great last year. All I'm trying to tell you is every, team, is every team has things to overcome just as much as Brooklyn has things to overcome. It's not a shoe in You're acting like these teams are just because there's three big-name guys that they're just going to get in there, and everything's going to work out great overnight. It's not going to happen that way. They'll figure it out before the regular season ends. They'll, they will figure it out. It may take a little bit of time, but they will figure it out. And then they, talent overrides talent. Like, they're just simply more talented than other teams. I was high on the Nets before they got Harden. I'm still just they, keeping the same energy. They, they, have, they, have, they have the, the best talent ball. to have to figure out how three super talented top ten players can play together. And it's a three-year experiment. They got three years to figure it out. If they win one chip after three years, that's a successful trade for them. They've never won in their franchise history. So who cares right. what they gave up? Right. Who cares who hasn't performed well? You can't take every situation from other teams, from other situations, and – bring them to the current situation. Sure, Tobias Harris played well on the Doc Rivers and on the Clippers when he was pretty much the number one guy. He's not the number one guy on the Sixers. But he's played sure, well. James Harden has had struggles. We, we know that already. He's going to actually be used less. His, his usage rate compared to Houston is going to be probably much less than it would be on the Nets. Does he have weight to lose? 100%. That's fine. You can do that throughout the course of the season. But he's also proven that he can drop 40 with you while eating lunch, dinner, and all, breakfast, lunch, dinner, all in the same meal. So it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Everyone loves to, you know, like bring in situations that happened three years ago, four years ago. This guy's not proven yet. He did this at this other team. It's a whole different team. And I think a lot of people are undermining the coaching staff that the Nets have. They've got Jacques Vaughn still on that on that assistant coaching staff who took that team with no superstars to the playoffs. You've got Mike D'Antonio reuniting with James Harden, who he helped turn into an MVP. 
So you've got a bunch of pieces in the coaching staff that also are going to be so critical to this team's success. For you guys to say, for, for us to say it's a clear cut and that's to the finals, yeah, maybe a little bit unfair, sure. But there's no other team in the East that can compete with them. None of the teams in the trades, in the trade that happened, are championship caliber teams. So, so they're all out. Miami, great team, greatly coached, great chemistry, great organization, not enough superstar, superstar power. In the playoffs, it comes down to superstars. Who is going to perform? Who is going to come out? Who is going to take that shot? Who is going to give you buckets? It's three superstars on one team, and we've seen in history that usually ends up working out at some point. Maybe not the first year, maybe not the second year, but this is a three-year project. They win one chip, successful trade. We can't say who won this trade until we see how this actually plays. Like, no one won this trade right now. I, I don't believe you could just – I don't believe you could make a trade and say this team won, this team didn't. You got to see how that if, plays if, if the Nets win one title – they won the trade. If they don't, they didn't win. It's it's literally just that cut and dry, that black and white. It depends. Throughout Harden's tenure with the Nets, if they win one, that's all that matters. New York hasn't had a championship since the bubonic plague pandemic or whatever the hell that was. They have had nothing <laughs> basketball-wise since Dr. J in 1400 BC, whatever the hell that he played. So with that being said, like they need one championship for New York. That's a way Durant can make his legacy, and so is James Harden. Getting over the hump, winning a, Durant winning a chip without the Warriors, and Harden getting his first title. But we're running out of time. If you ever want to give give one last thought, uh, yeah, I, I actually do have one last thought because Rob brought up a great point there, but nobody heard him. He said, "What about the bench? You know, in the, at the end of the so let's think about last year's champions, right? Who do we think of when we win last year's champions outside of AD and LeBron? We think of Rondo, right? We think of KCP. We think of." Cal Kuzma had a great finals, right? Let's let's go back to the Raptor. Huh? Back to the Raptor. Did, did your TV show me something different than mine? Kyle Kuzma had a good finals. And the Raptors. What do we talk about the Raptors? Fred Van Vliet, Pascal Siakam, Norman Powell. OG, well, OG was injured that year. But you have a bench. There's depth. That's just a thing to consider, man. That's, all we're saying started. is after the top three, like, okay, after the top three and a half with Joe Harris, it's really thin. It's really thin. DeAndre, and playoffs, DeAndre Jordan, Jeff Green. How, yeah, how many guys are you actually going to be deep, though? Jeff Green. Like, once the playoff, once, Jeff Green's not a bad piece. In the playoffs, you're looking at a 7-8 to eight man rotation max. They've got guys who can contribute. TLC, they've got Shamit. They've got two guys who can contribute. They've got hey, so guys who can other teams. We've seen TLC pop off in of games. We've seen Shamit play for other teams, and he's been able to contribute. If he can contribute yeah, on like the team. Yeah, Landry, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah can know bench. They've got Landry Shamit still. We know he can contribute. So yeah, he's good. like, like he's Falco good. said, there's there's a seven man roster, a seven seven man rotation in the playoffs. TLC and Falco what? off your bench. I, I'm not I'm not what's, mad what's, at that. What's Brooklyn's record right now? What's Falco record off right now? Bench? Seven and six. Seven and six. Seven and six. So we got just under sixty games to see how this works out. I know I'm gonna be tuning in in League Pass every night. That's for damn sure. Because <laughs> I do I do not trust James Harden. I, I don't, trust, I don't Kyrie. trust Kyrie. I don't trust Kyrie. I've been covering Kyrie. I've been covering Kyrie for years in Cleveland. And any last thoughts? We ready to wrap up? Um, yeah, no doubt, man. Uh, you can catch me on parksportsrecreation.com. That's my website. And then I cover um, NBA for 48minutes.com. Uh, right now, I'm covering the Heat, Magic, and Lakers right now. I'm probably going to add on some more teams. So just catch me there. Catch me on Facebook, too. Rob Parks Jr., Twitter, rparksjr85. Dope. What about, what about you guys? You guys want to shout out your platform quick? Yeah, so obviously check us out where the fadeaway is. If you want to hold your shirt up a little bit, because there is a bit of a spelling, it's F A E D away. Uh, if you want to go check out our YouTube, actually our Twitter has all our links. So if you go to our Twitter bio at the fadeaway, uh, you'll see us there. We're a podcast. We chop it up about everything basketball related, uh, but we're Raptors fans. Uh, but we don't just talk Raptors. So check us out. Subscribe to our YouTube, man. And um, yeah, that's it. Thanks for the plug. Yeah, fe yeah. Hey, fellas, let's collab, man. I'll come on y'all podcast and come on by, man. We can do it. Yeah, let's do it. Absolutely, man. Let's do it. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. For sure. Alco, thanks, thanks for, for, for having us. us man. Of course. Thanks for joining me. If you haven't already, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at the Falco Takeaway. Again, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. If you want to come on my platform, we could collab. Make sure you follow no, me. No. Make sure I hit you guys back. Check out your content. Hey, anything we disagree with more, we could always. And you're always, you guys are always welcome back on. Just let me know. Shoot me a text. Shoot me an email. Instagram is probably the best way to contact me. But, yeah, that's definitely collab more. This was fun. Thanks for joining me, guys.